Today we welcome Mark Tully, distinguished journalist, eminent broadcaster and an old friend of India. Mark, as someone with a distinguished record in radio and television, where do you think the real task of the journalist is? I mean, is it to report? Is it to inform? Is it to interpret? Where would you head your sort of? Well, I think uh, I was taught um, originally that it was to report facts are the bricks out of which you build your story, facts are sacred. And certainly I think that is what people want above everything else is reporting. But as my career progressed and things started to change, so more and more journalists got into the business of commenting as well. And I think it's terribly important that you should make it clear to your listener or your viewer when you are commenting and when you are reporting. Now there is a, a feeling that one sometimes gets that as you go deeper into a story that the facts themselves are not so sacred, you know, that as you are sort of uncovered layers, uh, more facts emerge which may change your story. And has that been your experience? Have you had that feeling? Yes, I you know that is true. Um, one, of the, one of the problems with reporting, of course, is and one of the skills of it is that you have to get things across extremely quickly. Now obviously, if that is so, other facts will emerge later on. And then I think there is a skill in bringing those other facts in. And a journalist who sticks to his original story stubbornly when other facts are emerging is, I think, making a mistake. But I think there's another interesting problem about facts, of course, is that it's to do with selection of facts as well. Because uh, there's no such thing as absolute truth, as some people seem to believe. If you and I set out to write a story, in all honesty, we would write it differently and we would select different facts because we can't put all the facts into a story. But does the fact that as your story unfolds over a period of days or months, um, uh, that the fact that you have the liberty of changing it, does this sometimes not lead to a kind of laziness with journalists about, you know, that you put out the first story that you can lay your hands on? Uh, is that... Uh, no, no, very much the reverse, okay. because nobody wants to change their story. And most of us are a bit like doctors. You know, the doctors are very reluctant to change their first diagnosis. We as journalists are extremely reluctant to change our story, and there's nothing more awful than to be told that you've got something wrong. So I don't think it does make us lazy at all. I think that fear of being told that you've got something wrong is a very good and strong discipline. Yeah. If I were to look at the task of reporting uh, from the other side, uh, which is that very often uh, journalists are accused of uh, manipulating facts. But uh, is it, in your experience, is it also possible that sometimes uh, the people you are reporting, uh, that they may actually be manipulating journalists in terms of how information is given out, the kind of quotes that are made available, is that? Yes, of course, that is true. There's a whole industry known as public relations, which is aimed at influencing journalists. And quite often, if you're in a newspaper, reading a newspaper, you can say, oh, I know where that story came from. And quite often, if there's a dispute, say, as nowadays there are so many disputes within companies in India, you know, business houses split up, families quarrel with each other. And you get stories quite often which are just blatantly one side of the story only. And you know, you can say to yourself, oh, that comes from the X side of the story. And then probably in another paper, there will be one from the Y side of the story. So there is a whole industry uh, uh, which is built up in trying to influence journalists. And the good journalist, of course, is a chap who recognizes this fact takes the information from the public relations guy and sets it against 
other information and goes out to find the other side of the story, in other words. Uh, what about the context in which your work appears, whether you are a print journalist or a radio journalist or a television journalist? Ultimately, how your story is viewed is um, also altered by where it appears and how it appears. Um, and that's something that journalists can't have control over. How has that been for you, the way your work appears, finally? Well, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, you do not, if you're a print journalist, you do not uh, write the story the same way for a tabloid newspaper as you would for what in Britain we call a broadsheet. Um, if you're a television journalist, you don't write the story the same way for, say, uh, a very popular television program as you do for an in-depth current affairs program. So you're absolutely right there. I think in my experience, though, I had one great good fortune. A lot of what I wrote went on the BBC World Service, and I'm not here to give a plug for the BBC. Obviously, I've left it anyhow. But I do have to say this, that A, that was a service which took news about India very, very seriously, and B, it was a service which had a lot of people back in London who knew a lot about India. They had the people who worked for the Hindi service, the Bengali service, and all those sort of people. So that was a tremendously good discipline for you, because you knew that if you got something wrong, they'd pounce on it immediately. So that context, that world service context, I found tremendously helpful. And that was my real love, was working for the world service. Um, beyond the, the sub-editors and the editors and that kind of uh, interference that a journalist is likely to uh, face, there's also the, the management who may, for commercial or ideological reasons, have uh, certain pressures that they might like to bring about on a journalist. And this is not likely to change in the years to come. So um, what, what, what is the best way for a journalist to guard? Well, really, you, you can't really guard in a way because the managers or the proprietors nowadays more and more are the bosses in the end. And if you say, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not going to write this story anywhere near the way you want it written, they will just fire you. Uh, and uh, especially in Britain now, the media business is a very unstable business. People uh, don't uh, stay with the same paper or even stay with the same broadcasting organization for long on the whole. So there's nothing really in one sense you can do about it. The only thing, of course, which you can do though sometimes is to try and, uh, well, you can quite often, you can temper the thing. Uh, you can at least make sure, you can certainly make sure that you're not telling lies in your story, uh, and you can try and present it in such a way as to be acceptable to the paper and acceptable to you personally and satisfying your sense of honesty. But it's difficult. And has it, in your, in your career, I mean, have you felt these pressures increase, or has it, has it always been like a fact of life? It's always been there. What? No, I think I felt the pressures increase, actually, because I think the, even the BBC, uh, not so much the World Service, as I said, but the rest of it has tended to go down market a bit, and that sort of thing. I'll tell you a funny story about one pressure which came on me, and that was when Rajiv Gandhi lost the 1989 election. And uh, I was interviewed by a program which kept on, the presenter kept on telling me, but Rajiv Gandhi's political career must be over. And I kept on saying, no, it's not over. Then, when I was doing the interview, I was sitting in Delhi, but you could hear the program. So I heard, after I'd finished my interview, the guy said, uh, the presenter said, well, Mark Tully says that Rajiv Gandhi's political career is not finished. But here's a report from our reporter in London who says it is finished. <laughs> so that was an example of them trying to pressurize me to say something which I didn't want to say. I didn't believe in, didn't believe in. Is fame useful for a journalist? Is it useful to be recognized, for your face to be familiar to people, or is it an impediment? I think it's a great impediment to myself, a great impediment. Um, I think that we would all be much happier and much better journalists if we could go back to the days when uh, if you wrote a story for the Times it just said from our Delhi correspondent underneath and nobody knew who from our Delhi correspondent was. I, I suppose in some ways I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't benefited from the cult of the, uh, 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 the personality in some ways. But uh, I think basically overall it's not a good thing for journalists it hasn't been necessarily a good thing for me personally, and I think if there were a way of doing away with it, it would be very good. But 
I don't see a way of doing away with it because you can't come on television and not be seen. Um, does it help to report on a place that you don't have any obvious direct connections with? Uh, yourself, for example, in your coverage for India. Do you think that you have been, in that sense, uh, you've had an advantage um, in, uh, rather than if you had been, for example, reporting about England? I don't know really whether that's, uh, that's uh, I don't know, it's a difficult question to answer because I think I know more about India than England. <laughs> I've lived here longer than I've lived in England. Um, but I do think that there are two types of reporters on the whole. There are what are called the farmen, the people who like to be rushed into any story wherever it breaks. And those who feel more comfortable, the more they know about the subject. I think, and I think they both have their role to play. And I certainly feel I belong to the second class rather than to the first class. I have done farm and type reporting, but I much prefer uh, doing stories about subjects which I know about. My second question, which is related to this, is that uh, in a sense that does it help, does it not having a connection with a place or an event, does it make you less partial, for example? Are you less likely to be swayed by emotional or other considerations? Well, yeah, I suppose in theory, but then uh, ignorance or lack of knowledge is a very m big minus to set against that thing. And of course, one does have to uh, try and uh, curb one's emotions or control one's emotions and not be influenced by things. But obviously, we are all human beings and there are some people we like and other people we don't like and these sort of things. And it's it's, it's the journalist's job to do his utmost to make sure that although he may thoroughly dislike politician X, that he still gives him a fair crack of the whip. Between print journalism, radio journalism, and now increasingly television journalism, which seems to be the, the most apparent face of journalism today, uh, is there a qualitative um, difference in the skills that one might, for example, require? Yes, a huge, I think there are very major differences. I think if you take television journalism, for instance, obviously you've got to have visual skills, which you don't necessarily need for written or radio, although you do in a way, because you've got to be able to describe things in radio and in written journalism, so you need that visual skill. Uh, the other thing about television, I think, is that you do also need some administrative skills, because it's administratively far more complicated. and. Uh, I think also that you need the skill of being able to stand up plausibly in front of camera and you must have seen many people who manifestly don't have that skill so you know that it's not as easy as some people might think. In radio, I think the great skill in radio is telling a story. Um, radio is all about telling stories and those who are good storytellers and tell their stories well, they will do well on radio. On radio also, I do think the voice does count a lot. You must have heard many times on radio people with not very attractive voices. And it's not a question of accent, funnily enough, it's a question of voice. And I don't quite know what the quality of a good radio voice is, but there is such a thing. That is very important. And of course, I would say that the skill of writing is more important in radio than it is in television, because in radio, you don't have anything to do to do the work for you, really. Your writing is almost entirely what's going to count. As far as print journalism concerns, I think it's uh, not much further away from television and radio, in a sense. Again, you've got to be able to tell a story. Writing is even more important in print journalism. And I think also that in print journalism, uh, much more time needs to be spent on uh, researching the story and getting to the bottom of the story. And therefore, quite often in print journalism, it is more important to be talking to people who can give you the background than necessarily talking to the main protagonists. Here, you and I are having an interview together. Uh, if you really want to find out about Mark Tully, though, uh, you have to go and ask my friends, my enemies, those who worked with me, my family, and all the rest of it. So again, there's more, I think, of that is needed in, in print journalism. So if we were to take something like the quote, which is such a the bedrock of various kinds of journalism. You mean the sound bite? The sound bite. Yes. Um, yes. The quote in print. Yes. Um, in television, increasingly, when one sees that the quote is, it's really something grabbed on the run. It 
may or may not be meaningful, it may or may not be intended, it's just so long as you have a piece of speech on tape, on camera. Uh, the chase for the court, uh, have you seen that change over time? Yes, it's become much more important, and I think it's, it's a pity. In the first place, uh, very often the quote then becomes the news itself. And therefore, you're either doing two things. Either if you get the guy on the run and all the rest of it, you're in a sense taking advantage of him being on the run, not giving him a chance to think about it. If he's thought about it, you're laying yourself wide open to just do the news as he wants to. I mean, if, if a guy gives you a sound uh, very deliberately, he's saying, this is the story, and you jolly well going to take it, you know. Um, and I think there's another problem with all these quotes, and I think it's a very important problem. It's just as I said about if you want to find out about Mark Tully, you must talk to other people about him. If you want to find out what is really going on, you must have off-the-record briefings. And if someone cannot trust you to be off-the-record, then how is he ever going to give you a proper briefing? You can't learn from a subject by listening to someone telling you the official line as actually drawn up so that if it gets on the air, no one can say a mistake has been made, no one can say a comma even is in the wrong place type of thing. You've got to talk to people. I have always found this, that you understand Indian politics, you must be able to talk to Indian politicians, and they must have the trust to know that you're not going to report what they said. You're going to use it for your information and for your background. Does that sometimes not become um, a very sort of uh, delicate balance between, uh, you know, information that you may want to withhold because it's been given to you in trust and information that you feel deserves uh, to be made more public? This is uh, the argument which is always used, but I myself would hold by the argument that it is much more important to give to people stories which are properly understood and that you can't, in my experience, understand stories merely by listening to what people say, even at press conferences when people try and trip them up and that sort of thing. It, everyone is getting far too clever for that sort of thing now. There is a problem, of course, sometimes. Uh, there is a clash of interest sometimes. I mean, if a guy says something too completely sensational off the record. But then there are ways around that quite often, and that is to try and get the story from some other way, you know. In India, we've started seeing in recent years the whole, uh, the, 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 the herd mentality of the press, you know, that everybody is in the same place at the same time, you know. I've often wondered that um, how is it that at least half of these people aren't elsewhere, you know. Uh, is this something that you, you have experienced in radio or is that... Uh, well, maybe it's very much in radio as well as in television and in print journalism yeah. now, very much. I mean, everyone has to have a story uh, on Mother Teresa dying and everyone will have, have to be at a funeral, you know. Everyone has to have a, sto had to have a story on Lady Di or Diana Princess of Wales and everyone had to have someone at the funeral. So there are these big events, there are these uh, elections take place, set-piece events take place, disasters take place, and everyone feels they have to be represented. And sometimes they are overrepresented. sometimes there are too many journalists from one paper or one broadcasting organization. But the real skill there, I think, again, lies in not necessarily falling into the herd mentality on the spot, in trying to make your story a little different to other people, trying to find out other facts about it, uh, trying to be ahead of the game quite often. That is where the real skill lies there, I think. And when it's not a crisis, when it's not an assassination or a death or a natural calamity, even then increasingly one senses that the herd still moves the comfort of being in the same place. At least you all know you've got the same story, you know. Uh, how, how, does a, how does a journalist break out of this and take risks? Well, quite often one of the way is you don't stay with the herd, if I can use it like that. You know, last time I was in Kabul, for instance, um, three or four of us stayed in a house. Once when I was in Kashmir, the herd all got locked up, but I was staying with a friend, and uh, I was able to go on broadcasting. So quite often the way you do it is by not staying with the herd and doing your own work in, in your own way. Um, but there are, of course, problems, because quite often there are editors who want you to go the way of the herd, you know, and you will get a thing saying, AP has this story, or Independent Television News has this story. Why is your story not like theirs, basically, you know? Well, there's a lot which, obviously, one learns through experience, and a long career in radio and television is uh, 
you know, helped you build your own sort of armor to yeah. go on with your work. But is, is, an, is an education, any kind of education, is it preparation for a career in journalism? Well, if we're talking about technical uh, journalistic education, uh, I'm illiterate or uneducated. I never had a technical uh, education. But of course, I did go on courses from time to time. But I would believe that I would have been a better journalist, probably, if I had had a, a technical journalistic education. I think it is a good thing. And I think more and more people now are coming into journalism with some form of degree or qualification in journalism. But I would say also two things. I would say that for my money, uh, you need a broader education than that. And I would personally, myself, not like to have done uh, my first degree as media. I would have liked to have done my first degree as I did in history and theology or something like that, which gives you a wider feel for wide things, and then do media studies uh, as a speciality afterwards as a sort of postgraduate type degree of some sort. Second, the second thing I would say is that I think it's also very important for journalists that they go to courses from time to time during their career. They learn new things, bad habits are corrected in this way, um, and, and I think that's a very important thing. You know, if you're in the army, for instance, you go through at least three stages of education during your career in the army, and I think as journalists it's very good to have time to sit back and think about what you're doing, to learn what other people are doing and that sort of thing. Mark Ali, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on journalism and the broadcast and radio situation in India and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.